Good afternoon, good morning to the ones that are joining us from the other side of the world. A real welcome to this webinar today, to all the participants, the enrolled ones, and uh, uh, our uh, welcome also to the panelists and facilitators of, uh, of this event. I'm Viviana Mangiaterra, I'm Associate Professor of Practice at the SDA School of Management in Bocconi University in Milan and uh, I'm representing the university today. Uh, we have organized uh, this webinar together with uh, the HEMA network of which Bocconi is one of the oldest members actually. So HEMA, the European Health Management Association, is a very important uh, body and platform in Europe and I would like really to acknowledge uh, how they have been championing in these months and in these weeks uh, this important uh, forum uh, for discussion, debate, sharing of experiences uh, on how the different uh, entities uh, of various European countries uh, have been facing the pandemic uh, of uh, COVID-19. So thanks a lot for hosting this webinar uh, within your platform and we hope that this webinar will be also contributed uh, to the excellent results and comes that your uh, uh, previous webinar and the next one will be created around the practitioners uh, and managers uh, of the European uh, various countries. Uh, this uh, webinar is also organized in collaboration with the uh, Mailman School of Public Health of Columbia University in New York. The Bocconi University and the Mailman uh, School of Public Health have uh, strengthened their partnership in the last couple of years, not only in organizing events like this one in which we pull together experts uh, and uh, really important eminent speakers uh, from uh, USA and uh, Italy and Europe, for events like this one in which again there is a sharing of experience, looking at different perspectives and debates and critical thinking around topics that are of importance for the two parts of the board. But also we have been joined forces recently in sharing some of the instruments for teaching, the existing one in particular, or creating new ones, particularly for teaching executive courses for managers. I'm referring in particular to the simulation course of hospital management that is a very relevant course and the topic of the webinar today. So the Menmo School of Public Health has delivered this course many times in many years but last year we have been honored of hosting this course for the first time in Europe at Bocconi University and we are also planning to have to offering this course again at the end of this year to Europe and this is a new version in which we have modified case studies, we have included models um, with a very strong focus on pandemic and so this webinar as well as the previous one that we organized together have been very instrumental for informing the new revised uh, simulation course uh, package. So with this uh, uh, let me before going into a bit the topic of the today webinar pass the floor uh, to Professor Axel Keening who is the president of the European Health Management Association for his opening remark. Could you thank have you, the thank floor? You. Thank you. Thank you very much Viviana and I'm absolutely delighted to have you all here and um, I'm especially delighted to have such a distinct and a very, very esteemed panel to, do, to discuss these issues here today. I'm Axel Kane, uh, I'm Associate Professor at Etchell University and I'm the, pre, uh, the, the President of EMA. Uh, I just recently came into that role and I'm just going to say a couple of words about EMA. So EMA, um, the European Health Management Associations, Viviana already talked very kindly about us, um, exists for over 30 years now and it's really a uh, organization that's trying to provide teaching and training um, uh, and exchange 
change opportunities for everyone who is involved in health management um, across Europe. But we also have uh, members uh, outside, just outside Europe. And uh, in particular, we, um, um, we are actually focusing our efforts very much on um, you know, conducting pr projects and uh, policy oriented projects very much, but also on exchange opportunities for um, uh, practitioners, but also for research in academia. So everybody who is involved in that. And that's something we've done over the last almost, well, more than 30 years now. And we are now based in Brussels. And um, clearly we have now been all, like every organization, been hit a bit by COVID and by the uh, inability to actually meet face to face. So um, I'm absolutely delighted we found a new way to do this with a new webinar series that Emma are actually putting on or have been putting on for the last two or three months really. And Viviana already referred to that. It's been really, really successful and we're absolutely delighted to have so many. And on a technical issue, I also just wanted to say um, every single previous webinar is actually on the website. So you can find it on the website. You can go back to, um, to our website and you can see um, all the webinars. Uh, they are free of charge. They are available, freely available for everyone. And um, we will do, of course, the same with this one. So um, if you're interested in what we've been talking about in the, in the past, uh, we have about 16 or 17 uh, webinars already on our, in our portfolio on the website. So do um, uh, uh, click onto the website and check it out. And um, uh, we have one more just, just um, coming up as well in December. So I just want to do, uh, sorry for this cheap plug, but uh, I just wanted to mention this. This is a future webinar on the 10th of December, 2020. And I hope um, um, that will be just as exciting as about unpacking the fragmentation that makes older people at higher risk of infection. So this is about uh, infection control and um, the care for older people. And I'm very, very uh, 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 glad that we have that in the, uh, in the planning on, uh, on the agenda for the 10th of December as well. So that's pretty, pretty much from my side. I'm, I'm very excited now to uh, um, see, hear from the panelists and from um, uh, our, uh, our colleagues here around here. And I'll pass, you, uh, pass this back basically to Viviana now. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Axel, for your introductory remarks. So let's go into the content and the topic today. So we'll discuss COVID-19 and, uh, and the question for this webinar is, uh, has this experience we are passing through really change and transform forever, not only for this uh, moment of emergency, the hospital design, the function of the hospital and how we take care of the patient, how we care for patients. So this is the overarching question of the webinar today. So it's a definitely very complex topic with lots of streams of discussion. So we are delighted to have a terrific facilitator as uh, Professor Sparer that uh, will guide us uh, in the discussion and uh, will moderate uh, and present the panelists and moderate uh, these discussions. Uh, so just a few words regarding him. Uh, Michael Sparer is a professor and chair of the Department of Health Policy Management at the Melman School of Public Health at Columbia University, New York. Has uh, studied and uh, written a lot of articles, documents, and his main interest is politics of healthcare, with particular emphasis on health insurance and health delivery system for low middle income uh, population in the context of USA, but also more generally and globally. And so with this perspective, he has been uh, writing articles and books. And let me mention among the others, the one that I love more, the Medicare and the limits of state health reform. And uh, of course, he has been also editor of an important journal like uh, the Health Politics Policy and Law for many years. So this is very, very short presentation because we could speak about Professor Sparrow for hours. But uh, among others, uh, uh, capacity and skills is a terrific uh, facilitator. So thank you, Michael, for accepting to moderate uh, this uh, exciting panel. And by the way, we have uh, more than 300 enrolled people that are listening uh, and recorded uh, the recorded or the recorded video um, of, of this webinar. Most of them are uh, in life, so they are with us. Uh, 
So we are encouraging you to really write to us, to intervene, and Michael will tell you how and when. So thank you, Michael. The floor is yours. Well, oh, great. Thank you so much, Viviana, for that kind introduction. Uh, and thank you also, Axel, for facilitating and coordinating uh, this event today, which I'm really uh, delighted and, and thrilled and, and really looking forward to participating in myself. Uh, I should add a couple of other things here at the beginning. Uh, I should say from the perspective of my role at the Mailman School of Public Health at Columbia University, uh, we are truly delighted more generally to be partnering with Bocconi, to be partnering with, with you, Axel, and, and, and the association uh, on today's webinar, and also on the upcoming hospital simulation, uh, which Viviana mentioned, which will be held, uh, speaking of plugs, Axel, but which will be held from December 1st to December 4th. Uh, it'll obviously be held virtually. Uh, and so there's capacity for people from any one of the 36 countries that is, uh, that, that's listening today uh, to participate in that. Uh, and if you're interested in learning more uh, about, uh, you know, about the simulation and how it works and the details and the logistics and so on and so forth, uh, if you go either to the Bacconi or the association website, uh, or to the Mailman website. Any, any of our three websites uh, will give you basic information about the simulation more generally uh, and how to become a participant if that's something you're interested in. Uh, I also wanted to note that this session uh, is sort of the second that we've done, Viviana, you know, sort of on this sort of joint Bacconi uh, Mailman effort uh, now joining with, with the association but we held a, a really terrific panel back in September uh, in which we examined, so the title of that one was Hospital Management During a Pandemic, Lessons Learned and Preparation for a Second Wave. Uh, and that webinar, if you wanted to see it, uh, is on both the websites of Bacconi uh, and, and Mailman. Uh, you know, we're really lucky to have the panelists that we have today. Uh, so what I wanna do now is take a minute to introduce the three of them. Uh, I also wanna add though, before I introduce our panelists, that we're hoping to really make this as interactive as possible, both among the four panelists, obviously, or three panelists and myself, but also among you uh, in the audience. And so what we're gonna do is really for the first half or so of our 75 or so minutes that we have left uh, uh, this morning uh, or this afternoon, depending on where you are, uh, what we're going to do is I'm going to sort of ask some questions of the panelists some lead a little bit of a conversation and they'll ask questions of each other. But in the last half hour, 20 minutes, half hour, I'm going to encourage people to, to join in and to participate and to ask questions themselves. Uh, you can pose questions on, on the chat if you have some logistical questions, you know, about if you have a technical issue, etc. Uh, and, you know, someone will respond to that. But if you're interested in asking a question of the panelists, I think what would be easiest if you would be if you went to the participants link uh, on the bottom of your screen. Uh, and by now, many, if not most of you are familiar with the process of raising your hand virtually on the participant screen. And when you raise your hand, you immediately go to the top of the participant list. I mean, it's like magic. You go from number 150 to, you know, to the top of the list. Uh, and at that point, I will see your hand raised uh, and I will call on you, uh, and perhaps you can say your name, you can unmute yourself, say your name, uh, maybe, you know, the organization or institution where you work, and then pose your question. Okay, our three panelists for today. Uh, Neam Gandhi uh, is the Executive Vice President. He has a lot of, a lot of titles, Neam. Uh, he's the Executive Vice President, he's the Chief Financial Officer, and he's the Chief Population Health Officer of the Mount Sinai Health System. Uh, it's an extraordinarily important set of roles that he plays. Uh, he oversees the finance departments for the Sinai Health System, for the medical school, corporate functions, as well, and I think in many respects, uh, most importantly, he's sort of the, the organizational lead around the overall clinical and economic transformation toward population health, that the Mount Sinai Health System is one of the certainly one of the United States and I think global leaders uh, in, in, in leading. Um, I've uh, been fortunate in that over the last year or two, I've gotten to participate uh, in, in a few different meetings and panels with Neam, 
Uh, he always has uh, extraordinarily insightful and thoughtful things to say. So I'm really looking forward to hearing Liam's comments uh, as we go along this morning. Uh, Alejandre Lorenzo uh, is the president of the Portuguese Association of Hospital Managers. Welcome, Alejandro, and thank you for joining us. Uh, he also works uh, as an administrator, a manager, a leader himself uh, at the Coimbra Hos University and Hospital Center. Uh, he's a longtime consultant to the World Health Organization, providing technical assistance on health system strengthening uh, more generally and financing. He's the vice chair of the technical advisory group that the WHO has on tuberculosis, tuberculosis control uh, for WHO Europe. He's the executive editor in chief of the Health Management Journal, obviously a, a relevant journal uh, for this audience today. Uh, and while I've just met Alejandre this morning, uh, I'm really glad to have done so and very much look forward to your comments and perspectives uh, from where you sit uh, as well. And then our third panelist uh, this morning, or again this afternoon, is Giacomo Santini, uh, who is the chief executive officer, the CEO. Uh, and here I'll have to be forgiven in advance for my mispronunciations, I'm sure. Um, I need to spend more time uh, in, in Italy, I think, and I get much better at all the pronunciations. Uh, but he's the CEO of the Azienda Asperidiella di Alas. You know, I'm going to let Giacomo in a minute say the name of his hospital system himself. Uh, but what I can tell you is that it's the hub hospital of the southern eastern area of Piedmont in northern Italy. Um, Giacomo has also co-authored and authored several books uh, and articles on lean healthcare management. And he, and this is near and dear to my heart, he's also done a lot of teaching himself uh, uh, on both master's level and university level courses, uh, has you know, an, uh, just a wide range of experience. Uh, and I've also just gotten to know him a little bit as part of this process uh, and are really looking forward to his comments today. So I am really, and I think we're all really honored to have such a distinguished uh, and esteemed panel. Uh, and again, the topic for today's webinar is COVID-19, will it forever transform hospital design and patient care? Okay. Now that said, uh, while the topic of today is about the hospital of tomorrow and lessons learned from the pandemic, uh, given where we are in the world uh, and given that I woke up this morning uh, to two kinds of headlines here in the United States, headlines over who won the presidential election, but headlines in Europe and in Italy uh, about new shutdowns in various regions of the countries, not full lockdowns, but more partial lockdowns and potential protests ensuing from the business community and obviously increased strains on the hospital systems in parts of Italy for sure, parts of Portugal, which is also seeing rising numbers and also concern here in the United States about dramatically rising numbers, although that has not yet hit here in New York City. I wanna just take a, a little bit of a tangent to start and maybe ask uh, Giacomo and then Alejandre to start us off and just tell us a little about how things are going uh, in Italy and Portugal right now uh, and you know how it's playing out at the hospitals you're affiliated with and maybe just give us a, a little bit of an update from your perspective on on where things stands with COVID uh, today on November 5th of 2020. Giacomo do you want to start us off on that? Sure thanks Michael and uh, thanks for your kind introduction. Uh, good afternoon everyone, good morning everyone uh, depending on which part of the world uh, you're uh, listening us from. Uh, the short answer to your question is that uh, it's pretty bad. The situation is uh, very, very tough at the moment. We've been seeing uh, the doubling up of uh, both the inpatient and uh, the positive cases here in uh, the region I'm working in. And uh, we are pretty much uh, uh, above the capacity that we have reached at the top peak in the previous spring uh, uh, pandemic uh, wave. And uh, thus the selective lockdown uh, have been uh, at least very much welcomed from the uh, healthcare community here in Piedmont because uh, the situation is getting really, really tough. Uh, and uh, the difference, the very big difference between uh, the spring situation is that when we got to this point, 
we are already pretty much in the middle of April, second half of April. Uh, we were already in a full lockdown since uh, four to five weeks. Uh, this time we are getting to numbers that we have seen at the very peak of the uh, first wave and we are just starting the lockdown at least in this region because in Italy uh, has been introduced a uh, selective lockdown where only the region that have like the uh, more uh, concerning numbers are introducing uh, uh, progressive measure and uh, Piedmont together with Lombardy are the two region uh, and Calabria as well. Uh, selected for like the uh, strongest uh, containing measure, which is basically a full lockdown, is Piedmont and Lombardy. So we are now uh, hoping that from now on we will start see some effect of this measure, which probably uh, will uh, uh, give us some uh, uh, space to work better in the next few weeks. But at the moment we are really struggling in uh, being able to uh, accept the patient uh, in our hospitals. Wow. Uh, I mean, it's it's scary, and I know we talked about you know for months we've been talking about second waves and and second waves and res resurgences, etc. But clearly, feeling it uh, as you are feeling it now uh, in in Italy, and particularly in northern Italy and and Piedmont, uh, you know maybe we'll come back a little bit later uh, and talk about sort of lessons learned from the first time around uh, and how it's playing out uh, for you right now there. But it, you know, uh, I certainly wish you wish you the best. Uh, Alejandro, what are things like where you are at this point? First of all, uh, thank you so much. Uh, it's an honor to, to be with you uh, all. Well, in, in uh, Portugal, the, we are facing the second wave. Uh, um, uh, the numbers are increasing uh, on a daily basis. Uh, we also implemented uh, um, selective lockdowns at this point uh, in the municipalities that have more than 240 cases in the last per uh, one, one 100,000 um, inhabitants in the last 14 days. Uh, so we have 70% of the population under uh, lockdown. Uh, what we are facing in the, and uh, we need to, to realize that uh, actually at the hospital side, we are quite passive and the patients come to us. So what we tried to do in the last months was to increase our level of preparedness. Uh, even though, um, and I must say that even the Portuguese uh, hospital managers um, did a great job in each institution, in each system, uh, we didn't see the same level of preparedness from our uh, government. So what we are seeing is that it's some, uh, in, at least in, in some areas, some, uh, um, um, or at least the coordination of healthcare services are not being uh, uh, what we would expect. Uh, even though we are taking uh, additional measures uh, in, in implementing uh, uh, step-down hospitals, in implementing or increasing our uh, intensive care ca capacity, uh, when we are seeing this higher and higher pressure in our hospitals, but not in all the network, uh, mostly in specific uh, uh, regions and specific hospitals. Thank you. Well, again, good luck to you. And I think we're going to have to keep coming back, uh, you know, to this question of, what you're dealing with now and how you can sort of translate those learnings uh, into sort of lessons for the future, recognizing that, you know, you're, if not overwhelmed, at least sort of dealing with, with real crisis situations right now. Niam, New York City is not in that kind of crisis situation right now. We were there last spring, but the rest of the United States, I, I looked at the, the news reports this morning and I think we had, I don't know, 110,000 or so new infections in the United States yesterday, 1,600 deaths, I think, in the United States yesterday. Um, you know, when you look at that, those numbers, uh, you know, from the perspective of a leader of one of the largest uh, hospital systems here in New York City, uh, what are your thoughts are you, as you're thinking about preparation here for what might be happening in, in a short time here in New York? Uh, you know, it's a, it's a great question, and obviously it's, you know, it's on our minds and we had a little bit of an uptick uh, you know a couple of weeks ago and uh, we're worried that it might be a start of our second wave and uh, it has, it's been subsided a little bit I think that the the United States is an interesting case study of you know because we have such a, a, a federated model with regard to uh, how you know lockdowns and social distancing are implemented uh, you know it's basically entirely up to the state uh, you know, I, I just, I look around the country and see, and it, you know, I talk to my colleagues in other markets, you know, we, at, at Mount Sinai, uh, we normally have about 
a little bit over 2,000 hospital beds. We peaked at over 2,000 COVID inpatients. And then for all of August and September, we only had 20. Um, and so we were down 99% off of our peak. And I talked to my colleagues in, in other markets, and none of them ever got down below 20% of their peaks. Um, and then, you know, meanwhile, you walk around in, in midtown Manhattan, which is normally one of the busiest places on earth, and, you know, it's a ghost town. And anybody who you do see is wearing a mask. Um, and so that there are, um, you know, I think as, as we look as we look back on this, we'll see that, um, you know, what, what we do in our communities is going to have an impact on, you know, what we can and how we handle things in our hospitals. Um, obviously, we're, you know, we're ready if, if we need to have a second wave, and, but we're, we're hopeful that, uh, that the way the community has rallied around uh, ensuring that we reduce community spread as much as possible uh, will, will keep us, you know, away from where we were on, on April 8th when, um, you know, when we really hit that, that awful peak. Yeah, no, it's a, I mean, it is a sort of a remarkable situation in that I think one thing that we have learned is if we have adequate numbers of good tests and we trace appropriately and we isolate appropriately and we treat appropriately and people wear masks and social distance and, and wash their hands and do all the things that we've been hearing about for months and you can avoid community spread, you don't have to have, you know, these extraordinary surges. On the other hand, sort of balancing all of those, uh, you know, public health measures with the economic consequences of, of partial lockdowns and full lockdowns, you know, creates this very difficult situations for hospital managers. All right, uh, let's switch gears a little bit uh, and try to put on our hats of where the health system is going to be going forward and where the hospital uh, is going to be in 5, 10, 15 years. Lessons learned you know, from the experiences that you're going through today. And let me start by asking a question this way. Um, there have been lots of articles written in recent years, even before the pandemic, about sort of the, the changing face of the hospital, you know, the movement from inpatient to outpatient, the hospital is a, a hub, you know, and, and not just a box anymore, consolidation of hospitals and sort of, you know, growth of large systems of hospitals, hospitals potentially as a a smaller physical space caring for, you know, high acuity complex cases and sort of shifting many of the other populations to other settings. Um, when you think about those initial trends that were just starting, sort of the, the where is care delivered, you know, and what's sort of the physical space of a hospital going to look like uh, 10, 15, 20 years from now, um, has COVID, how has COVID and the, the pandemic that we've had in these, in these last several months sort of either accelerated, you know, some of those trends or created new kinds of trends, uh, you know, and uh, let me sort of start with you, Neam, here, because I know Mount Sinai uh, a number of years ago, you know, created uh, an innovative new program called the Hospital at Home program, saying, you know what, let's take the hospital and, and sort of in effect, you know, take a part of the box and put it in people's homes uh, and send nurses to their homes as if, as if your bedroom was sort of you know, wing seven of, of Mount Sinai. Um, when you think about COVID and sort of the physical space of Sinai, uh, and I know you're engaged also in helping to think about building a new hospital. How do you think about the physical space of a hospital going forward? And what lessons do you think have been learned from, from COVID? You know, well, I think one of, the, one of the biggest lessons we've learned is the need for flexibility. Um, and that, that's something that, uh, you know, we, we haven't had a pandemic like this in over 100 years. Uh, and it, uh, I think everybody had a, had a sense of what capacity was needed, what type of capacity was needed. It was, you know, roughly the same year after year after year with some endemic trends. And, uh, and then there was a shock to the system. And so just, you know, as, as an example for us, you know, very directly in, in New York City, inpatient hospitalization leading up to 2020 uh, for three years running were down six to seven percent each year uh, with length of stay shortening as well. And uh, you know, New York City has more beds per thousand people than any other major city in, in the country. And so one could easily come to the conclusion of we need fewer beds. And as a matter of fact, we were on a path to do that um, and have been on a path to do that. We've taken you know, 500 beds out of our system, um, you know, about 20% of our capacity, and, and that's been fine. And that's what the community needed uh, because maintaining excess bed capacity is expensive and healthcare is too expensive in the United States and certainly in New York City. And so. Uh, in terms of rationalizing the cost structure, we were moving in a certain direction. And then, 
you know, then we looked at a, at a day in, in early April where, you know, we had increased our entire hospital capacity by over 50%. Um, and so you, you look at that and say, well, what does that mean for the future? Well, the future might mean that we need more beds. Um, I would contend that actually what, the, what that means is we need, we need a more effective and efficient way to scale up when needed for the one in a hundred year event, or maybe it's one in 20 year event or something else. Um, but we can't, uh, you know, we, we need to be good stewards of financial resources and taxpayer money. We can't, uh, you know, have lots of standby capacity that's, you know, excessive to maintain from a cost structure standpoint. But we do need to think about preparedness um, and how the hospital is prepared. And so whether that's bringing on excess beds or, you know, we, we develop low cost ways to convert normal rooms into negative pressure rooms, uh, so that they can be used as isolation rooms. Uh, we, we figured out ways to put up barriers so that we could set up COVID wings versus non-COVID wings or COVID units versus non-COVID units. So we learned a lot through this process, uh, but in some ways we learned how to do it in a in kind of a scrappy and efficient way because we had, you know, all of two weeks notice from when we diagnosed our first COVID patient to when we were overrun. And I think, you know, similar things are true, uh, I'm sure for both uh, Alexander and uh, Giacomo in, in, in their communities. Um, and so I think we need to be thinking about how to how to be ready to bring that standby capacity, you know, on board quickly. And then, you know, just a, a last note, um, uh, you mentioned the hospital at home program, and, and we've been running that for six or seven years. We ramped that up uh, extremely quickly during COVID. Um, and the, you know, as, as Michael mentioned, you know, it's a, uh, it's a program that allows us to deliver true acute level care at home. Uh, so patient is ready to go upstairs and instead we send them home in an ambulance with an IV, you know, daily or twice daily physician visits, thrice daily nursing visits, portable, durable medical equipment, imaging, all of that. Uh, and we, we scaled it significantly uh, during COVID uh, because we, we had to get patients out of the hospital quickly, get them home, get them treated safely. And, um, and I think uh, the future models for hospital care will continue to challenge us to be creative about uh, you know, what we may think of as the archaic definition of a hospital and what, what the future definition should be. No, that's really great. Giacomo, let me ask you, you, uh, you run a hospital now, you're the CEO of a, a large hospital system. Uh, and when you think of the, what that hospital system physically looks like today, you know, when you walk, walk the halls of your hospital, you know, and you walk through the different units, et cetera, when you, when you think about COVID and the pandemic and the experience that you've had both last spring and that you're experiencing again today, if you had to think about physically, you know, what would, what, and you were designing, you know, sort of the next iteration uh, of, of, of the hospital system, what would be different? I mean, what, what do you think from a physical sort of design structure, uh, you know, has either been an obstacle? I mean, are there parts of the, the physical structure right now that have made it difficult to you, for you to respond as effectively as you might to COVID? Uh, and are there sort of paths, do you think, creating an infrastructure that gives you the kind of flexibility that Neon is talking about, but also allows you to sort of do the core functions that, that you have to do as a hospital system? So how, how are you thinking about that for your system? I think the pandemic has been both disruptive and uh, a catalyst in a certain sense for a certain process that were a little bit slow to pick up. Uh, very disruptive, uh, especially uh, through certain uh, principle that uh, has been followed in the last uh, 10 to 15 years, maybe 20 somewhere, uh, considered as gold standard. For example, the fact of reducing uh, uh, the uh, stocking of material in order to improve efficiency. Uh, the or whatever is needed in the hospital, or the idea of like setting the uh, hospital care based on uh, the intensity uh, of care needed uh, for our patient. Uh, all these things, uh, which were considered a best practice till uh, one year ago, uh, in the pandemic have basically played out uh, uh, to be uh, a problem. And uh, the structure were more advanced, were more efficient, that they had layout with open space and uh, a more uh, uh, flexible environment uh, thought not for uh, an infection purpose, uh, were the ones who were more in difficult. Uh, versus old hospital, for example, I've seen in, in our region, old hospital that were uh, still structured with a separate building uh, with the, uh, the logic of like the old different type of uh, uh, specialties separated uh, among them 
were much more flexible in reconverting the uh, structure as needed, as we had to do basically in our hospital because we uh, we had to several uh, specialties uh, to like a COVID hospital basically uh, re. Uh, um, uh, joining uh, uh, all the uh, sectors that were basically clean of COVID and uh, converting uh, their area, the different uh, units into uh, COVID area. So uh, this flexibility is definitely not built in uh, in the way we are structuring hospitals right, right now. And uh, as has been said, the flexibility at this time is uh, very important because uh, in Italy we've seen uh, a very tough period in the spring and after the lockdown, we basically uh, got back to uh, almost normal life. Maybe we got back to uh, too much normal life, especially in the last part of the summer. And now we're paying that because uh, we are seeing like the spike in uh, uh, the, the pandemic coming, coming back again and worse and more spread it out across the entire territory in the nation. On the other hand, I think COVID has been And if we are thinking at uh, the uh, telemedicine uh, and all the uh, like uh, telecare that we can offer to our patient, in the period of the pandemic, we definitely had to uh, use those instruments, even when we're not refined and we're not still tested enough, uh, in order to treat a patient that cannot be uh, left alone for that long time that the hospital have not accepted the uh, patient other for urgency. So I've been thinking of all cancer patients that have been forward at their home through uh, e uh, either uh, uh, video uh, or uh, like other way of contacting them and other way to uh, letting them access the services without coming physically to the hospital or coming inside the hospital. And the fact of keeping home the people is definitely uh, something that has also come out more loud uh, in terms of the importance of uh, redesigning our model so that the hospital is not just a physical place but it's more a network citizen we have seen the difference the huge difference in italy uh, across the region where the model was more incentivized on hospital care versus on uh, uh, the care uh, like at home and uh, in the territory and we've seen one of the most advanced regions, which is Lombardy, going really in a crisis because there's a model that is based on hospital versus Veneto, which is also a northern Italy region that has an advanced system. It's born based on the general practitioner for like caring the patient, dealing much better with the, uh, the same level of intensity of the pandemic in the last uh, uh, spring. So, this definitely to point the flexibility and the ability to keep uh, the patient uh, uh, home as much as possible is something that uh, are going to be not only for the moment but useful also in the future. Great, thank you. That was really helpful. Uh, Alexandra, let, let me get you involved here. Um, you know, you've heard what Neam and Giacomo said about some of the need for flexibility and you have beds and you need the beds at the right time. There's, there's questions obviously about you know, the supply chain, having the right PPE at the right moment and the right number of ventilators, you know, you, don't, you can't necessarily have a, a storage room just filled with ventilators that are going to sit there for 10 years and not be used and sort of how you think about that. And you have sort of a, a unique role, at least for, for us here today, in that you're both in a particular hospital yourself, but, you know, a leader and a manager of a hospital, but you're also the president of the Portuguese Association of Hospital Managers. So you have a real feel for what's happening around, around the country uh, and sort of how different hospital systems are sort of responding and reacting. What are you hearing uh, in, in Portugal and elsewhere about how you know, sort of different hospitals are either coming up with new ideas for, for dealing with some of the things that, that we're talking about and some of the need for flexibility that we're talking about? And also in your own institution, again, what, what do you think some of the strategies are for the physical space of, that you have right now that you maybe should be using in different ways going forward. Well, thank you so much, Michael, for the, the interesting question. I believe that in the last or previous to COVID, we have done uh, and we were in this trend to develop ambulatory services, as you were mentioning. Uh, uh, hospital at home, reducing uh, hospitalization, for example, in case of surgery. In my hospital, for example, we have nearly 70% of our surgeries that are done in one day surgery. 
uh, we develop remote monitoring programs for COPD, for uh, cardiac uh, insufficiency. So this kind of programs were uh, being developed probably in the low pace. Uh, and uh, of course, this, uh, uh, the COVID situation at least accelerated our telemedicine programs and at least the need. Uh, but one of the issues that uh, we have seen and one, one, uh, one thing is what we want the system to achieve. The other one is what is going to, 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 to achieve. And the first thing is that due to the need to, uh, uh, to redirect services to COVID, what we have seen is that we weren't able to follow adequately most of our chronic patients. Uh, and at this point, I'm really afraid of the situation, at least in Portugal, for excess mortality for non-COVID patients. And actually, even though we have developed so many programs for chronic diseases, we continue to have, uh, uh, we weren't able to deal with those uh, patients and mo mostly with the elderly population. And what we are seeing is an excess mortality in over 65, so 75 years old uh, uh, population. So what, I, what I'm seeing is that, of course, we, we, we imagine a new hospital that is this kind of liquid, liquid hospital that what we were thinking before the COVID crisis. But what, what I've seen now is that actually the system will be worse after the COVID crisis. It is not getting better and we need to realize this. Even though we get all this attention from the media, from the politicians, we really need to focus in what it matters that is to accelerate the refoundation of our healthcare, healthcare system. And in this sense, I see four major scenarios coming from the COVID. The first scenario that I believe that is quite positive is this idea that public health and prevention are essential to increase the levels of health of the population. So this idea of population health, uh, I hope that we go uh, uh, through the scenario because most of our hospitals, and they must say this, we are all or most of, our, of the panelists are hospital managers, uh, but mostly we need to realize that we need to be healthcare managers or health managers. So in this sense, I believe that we need to push for this population health uh, scenario. No, nonetheless, I, I believe that we are going to see also another second scenario that will be more focused on developing this secondary care outpatient services. Uh, that was the, the trend that comes the, from the pre-COVID, uh, this major ambulatory uh, medical services, uh, or, or the day hospitals, hospital at home, um, remote monitoring of, uh, uh, of chronic diseases, but mostly from the hospital side, not from the primary care. So this scenario, the first scenario is that what I, and, and, and there is a push for it, and we need to realize that these, there are some stakeholders that are trying to push for it, is, is that an increase of the hospitalization due to this idea that highly differ, differentiated services are the best for the population. And we see this trend, for example, in the need to increase intensive care, ventilators, this big trend on realizing, no, we need to build more and bigger and more complex hospitals. And we can see also this trend that is coming uh, uh, on. And the other trend and the, the fourth scenario that I see, and just to finalize is the no money scenario. Uh, and Southern Europe, uh, most of our countries have highly public debts uh, that will reduce the ability of the, uh, the healthcare sector to invest in new services, invest in new structures. And this no money scenario, new capital investment scenario will be a, a major trend. I really, and my major concern that in, in one or two years is to convince uh, a government to invest in healthcare. Uh, mostly because I don't know if uh, Giacomo also has this uh, idea, but in Southern European countries, uh, uh, public debt is a major concern and we depend highly on public investment. I really don't know even the, 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 the program that is being developed by the European Commission, I, and I think in that sense, Emma can play a role in it. We really need to convince the structural funds and the funds that are being deployed to, 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 to allow uh, 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 the comeback of the economy comeback will be uh, uh, invested 
in promoting this refoundation of healthcare. So those are really very interesting trends that you point out, and, and you raised a number of really important questions that I want to have us focus on, including the, you know, the need for sort of public health and prevention, uh, the fact that hospitals basically, by the time someone gets to the hospital uh, and is entering the intensive care unit or the ER in the hospital, it's not too late. I mean, the hospital can provide care and service, but it's way later than it should be in terms of the kind of prevention and public health needed. Uh, you mentioned the sort of excess, uh, you know, excessive mortality and, and but I, I want to just, and, and telehealth, obviously, you mentioned, but I want to focus a little bit on, on the last thing that you said, which had to do with sort of the, the need for sort of new resources to build the kind of not only hospital system that we need, but the kind of health and healthcare system that we need. And I think one thing that we've seen, certainly in the United States, and I think around the globe, is that COVID has, um, has really highlighted many of the disparities uh, in healthcare system and many of the disparities in social systems more generally in both the United States and around the world. And I, I wanted to sort of pose this question, do you worry when you think about investment that you know, we're gonna see sort of a growing disparity in, in sort of the hospitals? I mean, some of the large, to be frank, some of the large academic medical centers like the Mount Sinai's of the world are gonna be able to invest and build uh, sort of really innovative new kinds of systems uh, while some of the public hospitals, if they don't get sort of significantly increased funding from either government sources or other kind of sources, are going to, in a certain sense, be left behind with the same physical structures that are failing, as you said, or not working. I mean, what, what do you, and anyone can jump in on this uh, that, that wants, what do you think about sort of this question of building the hospital, who's going to pay for the hospital of the future that we really need? You know, should we be relying on sort of hospitals themselves to sort of finance this through whatever mechanisms they have? Should government be financing it? And this could be US, Italy, or Portugal. And if government does finance it, how do you balance the, the sort of government regulation of the system that they are paying for with sort of the hospital's desire for some autonomy and sort of building the system they want? So there's a lot of questions sort of built into that question, but let me, just, let me throw it open to the, to the group. My opinion. Um... Just to, to, to start yeah, sure. the, the, the war. Yeah. <laughs> no, in my opinion, what, what we see is that, uh, and previous to COVID, we were seeing an increased dystopia uh, with the precision medicine that are highly costly uh, at high cost. And we really, I really don't know where we were moving. We are moving, and, and actually, when you see even the treatment for Donald Trump, you see one person that have an access to treatment that is very specific and the rest of the population that doesn't have any access to this uh, 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 that kind of uh, uh, treatment. So you see in this world of this dystopic world and increasing and actually sponsored by the, the head of states, uh, as you have seen in the, in the US. What I believe is that we have, of course, uh, 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 the risk of seeing this trend continuously uh, in the, the way that we are uh, providing care. Um, this increase of inequalities, and we need to realize actually that with the economic crisis that is coming, increased poverty, increased unemployment, we are going to see an increase of needs from the population. With, the, the, with all the elective activity that we didn't provide for the last months, with the aging factor, we are going to see this boom of needs that actually probably in most of the systems we didn't diagnose uh, during the, the, the last months. So we are going to see an increased need in the hospital sector, in the, all the healthcare sector. I think what we need real to realize is that we need more investment. What we need to, to, to try to influence the trend is to get that investment for the right care. Mm -hmm. uh, and we have the knowledge to, to do it. Uh, we study a lot in the last years and really uh, public health schools need to step up and support this new investment in uh, this idea that I, I was calling in the first scenario, this population health scenario. Right. Liam, you're the, the chief population, yeah. population officer at a large academic medical center. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I completely share uh, Alexander's con concerns there and, and I think it's a uh, it's something we need to be thinking about with regard to the disparities. I, I'd also say, my, you know, my other concern is uh, not just in not just in the elements of healthcare that are treat and respond, 
right, to illness, but in the elements that are related to prevention uh, and being upstream, there's there's a whole health equity uh, challenge there. So, you know, access to care, uh, but even as, you know, we saw the boom in telemedicine, right? And so, uh, in many ways, people say, oh, you know, telemedicine, is, you know, it's easy. It's easy for everybody to, you know, to access. It's like, well, you know, 50% of our Medicaid beneficiaries uh, at Mount Sinai don't have reliable broadband access. There are broadband deserts all across, you know, Harlem, parts of Brooklyn, parts of Queens, uh, and, you know, I'm sure the same is true in, in many other countries. Uh, a lot of them have uh, pay-as-you-go data plans on their, on their cell phones. Well, you know, if they, what, what's, a, what's a video visit actually worth for you, right? If you have to pay for, for each minute of it. Um, and so, you know, th this, this digital divide, is, you know, as we call it, is, uh, you know, is a serious concern. And so we're working with community-based organizations to see what we can do to expand capacity and access to, uh, to some of these digital health interventions. Same things with remote patient monitoring, and you know, we're doing a lot of that uh, as, as patients are unable to come in for care in the, with the same regularity. But we need to be thinking about the, the socioeconomic impacts uh, and the and you know the challenges that that they can present to getting patients the care that they need. So there's there's that piece you know as well. Um, I think go, going back to your to your question about who you know who should pay for all of this, um, I think it, it it does need to be coordinated in some way. Um, and it, it, it would be it would be an absolute shame if we ended up worse than a shame if we ended up in a situation where uh, that that emergency capacity uh, whether it be you know hospital beds whether it be certain types of treatments whether it be personal protective equipment uh, you know was there for was there for the for the wealthy and not for the poor right I mean that that would be in, in any country in the world uh, you know, but speaking to the U.S. here, I think it would be that that would be devastating. And so there does need to be some coordination. Um, you know, I think it, healthcare funding in the U.S. is really complicated. Some of it is you know federal, some of it is state, some of it is private. Uh, but but this base, I I would hope that we would think of this base ability to uh, to address things like a pandemic, to address not just the primary effects but also the secondary effects that that Alexander mentioned of. You know, increasing disease burden for people who you know who had to forego care, or the tertiary effects. You know, what happens when when you lose your job and you can no longer affect, uh, afford your medications that keep you healthy? Uh, but the primary, secondary, and tertiary effects. I, I would hope that we create some sort of public safety net model uh, that allows for continued investment there uh, in a way that is distributed appropriately across the entire population and not just reserved for the few. Well, certainly, excuse me, here in the United States. One of the major issues back in March and April uh, was, in effect, the lack of national coordination over the distribution of needed PPE, ventilators, et cetera, resulting in states and not only and communities and hospitals competing, you know, competing on price, competing on size of, of the order, and so on and so forth with each other, you know, for, for needed PPE. And as a hospital manager, uh, that's got to be, you know, I mean, I suppose if you're a hospital manager at a wealthy, highly leveraged institution, you do a little better in that situation. But if you're at a safe net institution, it's kind of scary. Giacomo, I know one of the efforts in Italy to deal with some of the, sort of the, you know, the disparities, say, in wealth between the North and the South was there was a national commission that was at least created in theory, uh, I as I recall, to try to help sort of, you know, sort of handle and coordinate the distribution of PPE and other kind of services. I mean, as you think about going forward, how has that played out and what lessons do you think can be drawn on, on this issue that we've been talking about here? In Italy, indeed, was created a central uh, commissioning that uh, basically uh, got all the orders from all needs to the uh, hospital and regions uh, based on uh, criteria at a national level did play out uh, well for the region that were a little bit more um, unable to provide the uh, material they were needing. Uh, and at the same time, this did not uh, completely uh, respond to the need that the uh, hospitals and region uh, at all levels had. So it was a two-way approach where at the central level there were some uh, distribution of material needed and uh, at the local level each hospital had to move uh, uh, autonomously to fill the gap where these were coming. 
uh, this, this is definitely that's something that is, we are uh, not facing right now because we had uh, the summer basically to uh, organize everything. So we did stock up uh, over six months of uh, everything needed in the hospital, assuming the maximum uh, consumption of the peak uh, uh, in the pandemic in the spring. Uh, and In Italy now is that uh, the pandemic is so spread out all over the territory that you cannot access extra capacity from other region or other hospital that were uh, serving uh, uh, an area less uh, struck from uh, the, the COVID. So uh, at this time everyone is fighting and is using the full capacity of whatever it has so there's less access at least I'm thinking from uh, my hospital perspective where we got uh, among the first uh, area of Italy uh, that uh, has to face uh, the high numbers of the pandemic and we got help from all over the region and as well from other region. At this time uh, no one is able to help anyone pretty much because uh, uh, we are really uh, all uh, uh, trying just to uh, face the challenge at a local level which is pretty much very spre uh, spread out evenly. So let me follow up on that, Jacques, for a minute. You said one of the reasons you're okay now in terms of PPE, for example, and, and some of the supply chain issues is you had, you know, the initial surge and then you stocked up for several months and you had six months supply. When you think about, again, the hospital of the future, is having a six month supply of everything, what the hospital should be doing, is that the right answer? Or what is the right answer for the hospital five years from now? When, once we have a, a vaccine and once we've sort of, you know, got some additional treatments, you know, and God willing, once COVID-19 is not nearly the crisis and the problem that is today, when we are thinking in the future about a potential pandemic, how much of a supply should we have on hand and, and where should we be keeping it? What are you thinking about that question uh, for your hospital and, and others? This is a very tough question because, uh, as I was saying before, the COVID has been very disruptive in uh, many things that we have been uh, building uh, with uh, uh, hard work in the last 10 years in trying to be efficient. So reducing stocks, uh, yeah. centralizing uh, uh, activities. So having just one laboratory that is serving a full region, which is like better in terms of outcome, better in terms of accuracy and better in terms of efficiency. And uh, all of a sudden, this kind of thing region who had worked uh, in that way. So uh, this is really a tough question because for that time, uh, the stocking up uh, of six months, which is kind of insane from a managerial perspective in, a, in like an efficient management of an hospital uh, was kind of needed because we couldn't face uh, a second wave without being prepared. This would have been unacceptable. Uh, on the other hand, I don't think this should be uh, the way we approach the future uh, independently of what happened. We will need to, to see how this plays out. And definitely in the short future, we'll need to be uh, safe. So we will probably be more inefficient. And uh, I already see this happening a lot, at least in my country. Uh, and it's kind of scary at the same time, because uh, in the last 10 years, uh, as I was saying, a lot of work has been put through efficiency, which at the same time played out in better outcomes in better results, in better healthcare in general. So the spending more, uh, getting more approach doesn't work for healthcare. And we, we've seen this like really clearly. In this moment where we are healthcare, because we've seen as a, a society that uh, healthcare is related to the global economy and what's happening worldwide is telling us every day that like uh, the number of people who get COVID impact uh, the, the stock market and uh, impact like uh, everyone's lives. So the fear of uh, uh, something like this happening again probably will like uh, uh, um, call for more funding in the healthcare. The challenge will be to use wisely this funding and not waste it and disrupt the, what we've done in the past to get a better healthcare. So there is, this is a really fascinating question. I mean, you've had this drive toward efficiency, you know, over the last decade that you talk about, and then you realize in the drive toward efficiency, you were you were short of needed equipment. And now, sort of fighting the most recent war, you're oversupplying uh, on equipment, which is okay and needed given the surge. And I guess the question I have, the, at the sort of follow-up question I have is, to what extent as you think about the future, um, will you be relying on sort of data, you know, to sort of forecast, you know, I mean, obviously one of the, you know, one of the needs that we have is an ability to once a, and we didn't have this, or the way we should have had it, I suppose, with, with the virus when it first started in Wuhan, and, and, and we could talk about why and what happened there. But the ability to quickly sort of, you know, 
have a sense of where the hotspots are, what's sort of an emerging need, and sort of be able to forecast using AI, using big data, et cetera, et cetera, you know, sort of what kind of demands are gonna be on the hospital, not just around a pandemic, but around all the kinds of needs that you have. So maybe sort of, I just wanna throw out the question of how are you using differently now, perhaps, or what are you planning to do differently in terms of your forecasting, sort of your future needs to be flexible in your terms, uh, Neam? I mean, in order to be effectively flexible, you want to be able to sort of, you know, in a timely fashion, have the data you need to sort of tell you what you're going to need a month from now or two months from now, you know, what's happening in your community. Is there a, you know, an outbreak of A, B, or C? So how are you thinking about using data in different ways, given, given the sort of pandemic and sort of the kinds of questions we've been talking about? Nia, yeah. do you want to you know, from, from our From our perspective, I think, you know, we're, we're, there's a there's a top up and a bottom down to it, right? So there there is the data side of it, and looking at uh, you know trends around utilization of supplies, utilization of resources, um, how they've peaked, how they've you know fallen, and there's you know the, there's there's science to, it's used in in many industries, right? Where you where you look at you know what what do you need from a in a you know 95 percent confidence interval and a 99 percent confidence interval, right? You know you, we can take multiple years of data, and we're doing that uh, to look at you know, kind of the more, the, the things that are predictable or that have happened in the past. Um, and then we, we're also instituting a, a, a deeper level of rigor now, especially as it relates to pandemic, but we're, you know, going through other scenarios as well of, uh, of the hypothetical driven approach. Because as, as an example, uh, if I pick on, you know, one of probably the most lightning rod uh, uh, issues in, in PPE, you know, the N95 mask, right? Um, we, the, until actually, you know, sometime in August, there were no U.S.-based manufacturers of N95 masks. So, and the vast majority of the supply chain for the entire globe ran through China. You know, when when the virus had its first outbreak there, <laughs> and they stopped the shipment, and there was there was nothing we could have done, even with six months' notice. We're in the same situation actually now for, oddly, for nitrile gloves of all things, right? Where, where utilization, you know, our utilization as a health system during the peak of the pandemic was 400,000 gloves a day. But the problem with nitrile gloves is our utilization when we're not in a pandemic is very high also. Again, no US-based manufacturers. And we've been told by all of our suppliers there won't, that there will be a shortage for anybody who wants them in the US because everybody's having the same challenges and, you know, not allowing export. Anybody who wants them in the U.S. is going to have a challenge getting them until uh, late next year because they can't stand up a plant in time. And so some of these things, we actually need to think about the hypothetical and look forward for these, you know, uh, you, that I think about the, the comments about black swan events, right? There's no such thing as a black swan event. There's always going to be something, um, but we need to think about all of those potential black swan events and actually do the right you know, and again, this is this is common in many other industries. They do this in the, um, you know, they do this in the nuclear energy industry. They do this in many manufacturing industries. You do all your scenario planning, your emergency preparedness, your business continuity. You have your playbooks for each one. You, you know, quantify the level of risk based on, you know, whatever information you have. And, you know, you ensure you're adequately prepared. And, you know, I think what we learned is for supplies, we, we need to think about uh, a durable and diversified supply chain which historically, as, as Giacomo said, we, we were on a you know, quest towards pure efficiency, just in time, you know, don't have more than two days on hand for anything. We know our suppliers always come through in normal situations. And so, you know, now we've looked and we've diversified and made our, diversified our supply chain so that it's more durable. And if the industry doesn't produce that, well, then we need to hope that maybe there's a federal stockpile or maybe a state stockpile. And if, if none of those things emerge, yeah, then then we're just going to get a bigger, you know, warehouse out in Long Island and, you know, <laughs> and stockpile some more PPE, which is, you know, as Giacomo mentioned, that probably the least efficient way to do it. Um, but if, if the industry won't coalesce around something or the, the regulators won't coalesce around something, then, you know, then we'll be left to do it for ourselves. And again, I'm hopeful, though, that, that we'll land in a place where, where the healthcare industry learns with some other industries that are, you know, more, uh, more used to planning for edge tail case low probability but catastrophic events we're not used to that in healthcare we don't think about the one in 100 catastrophic event we think about the one in 10 you know pretty significant event 
Um, and I, there are other industries that, that do think about the one in 100 catastrophic event, and we need to bring that rigor to our emergency planning. Interesting. So, Alexandra, do you think that healthcare is going to become, uh, you know, adopt some of the tools of some of these other industries that Liam's talking about and, and be able to do some of the kind of things we're talking about this morning? Is that, is that where we're going? Do we have the capacity to do that? Well, we have the capacity, I suppose, if they're doing it in other industries, but do you see that happening uh, in, in healthcare and hospitals in okay. Portugal? And, um, yeah. No, following what Niamh was saying is that uh, actually the, the issue is not from the hospital side, it's from the, the, the supply chain. So we need to, to focus in the safety of our supply chains and the diversification of our supply chains. That's the issue. It's not a matter, I don't see the hospital of the future to have big stockpiles of anything for, for sure. What we need to assure is that we have a diverse, diversified uh, supply chain and in some sense, even for national security purposes, we need to assure that at least some of the goods uh, are uh, safely uh, uh, produced and uh, arrive to the hospital. So in that sense, I think we are going to see a step up of, for national security purposes or for regional level security purposes to see this kind of, uh, um, of trends. The other point that we were mentioning, I think data, that's, that's an, another point that, I, uh, uh, that is quite relevant that we were mentioning previously. Um, in, during March, we, in, the, in Portugal, we developed a tool that uh, uh, was adopted by the World Health Organization and it is being used in several countries at this, at this moment. That mostly is, is the ADAPT tool, it's, you can Google it, is a search planning tool that help us, according to the evolution of the pandemic, that uh, allow us to calculate the number of beds in common wards, or oxygen therapy wards, uh, mechanical ventilation wards, and all the, the personnel that go with it. So medical doctors with training in ICU, uh, nurses, uh, common nurses, all, all, all the personnel. So I think that kind of tools of prediction are going to be much more used in the future. I must say that previous to COVID, most we have some experience, in, at least in some hospitals, to use this kind of predictivity tools, for example, in emergency room, to predict if that patient that arrives to the triage is going to be hospitalized or not, releasing an hospital, uh, an hospital bed as soon as possible to have that patient. These kind of tools, not this kind of, not only analytical tools that are quite broadly used in the hospital sector, but tools that will uh, uh, not only advance analytics, but mostly intelligence, uh, uh, artificial intelligence tools are going to be a big trend uh, in the future. What I'm, what I'm afraid of is that uh, most of the systems are not ready for it. Uh, and again, uh, we, we see this, this topic movement uh, uh, where more prepared healthcare systems are going to use those tools and be much more prepared and other ones that don't have that kind of it's disparities again. Yeah. yeah. Let me ask, I'm gonna ask one more question. I could keep asking questions I think for forever, but looking at the clock, we have about 20 minutes or so left, and I want to make sure that uh, participants have the opportunity to ask some questions. But I want to ask one more question, and then, then I really want to open it up. So I'm going to ask my question, but then if you have a question in the audience that you want to ask, uh, you could start raising your hand now and, and uh, on the, in the participant list, and then I will start calling on you. But first, I want to ask a different kind of question. I want to move away from, for the moment, from data and supply chains and what's the emergency room going to look like and so on and so forth. And sort of talk a little bit about the, the human element of managing in a hospital uh, through a pandemic uh, and, and how you think the hospital of the future should handle. There's an enormous amount of both physical and emotional stress and toll that I think health and healthcare workers uh, go through in responding to a pandemic. I mean, I'm, uh, you know, Niam at Mount Sinai, I, I can only imagine. Uh, you know, what it, is, what it was like uh, in, in March and April, the, the stress, the tension, uh, you know, Giacomo, Alexandra, I mean, you had it in March and April, you're having it again now. And in fact, it's probably even in a way more difficult now for some of the healthcare workers because they went through this, you know, six months ago and they were perhaps motivated and it was first happening and there was a real sense of camaraderie and they were dealing with it. But now it's like, oh my gosh, here we go again. As a, as a manager, uh, how do you sort of prepare your staff, the physicians, the nurses, the administrators, the techs, you know, the orderlies, you know, for dealing with a crisis like this that's potentially dangerous, you know, that's going to put their own lives at risk uh, in, in, in treating patients, 
Um, how do you get them ready for the physical and, and mental stress of dealing with this kind of event? Uh, uh, Giacomo, do you want to start us off? You're going through this now again, uh, but, but sort of what kinds of things should hospital officials be doing to, to deal with this? I think you described very well the situation we are facing right now because uh, if it's uh, if in March and April we've seen uh, a lot of uh, enthusiasm and uh, a lot of like uh, availability of people just like uh, really give all themselves because of they were facing a new uh, challenge a new crisis and uh, there was a, really a lot of enthusiasm and everyone felt like hero because all the people around really treated like a uh, health professional like heroes Right now, the morale is much lower because uh, that support that we used to have at the beginning because everyone right now is in a, a very tough situation and uh, everyone is really like thinking for uh, himself because uh, all the people at every level outside of the hospital are facing different challenge which is probably not directly relating treating people, but like uh, in uh, surviving their business or just like uh, uh, organizing their family due to this pandemic. So it's a much tougher uh, moment in terms of uh, uh, people morale. I think what helped out is uh, the preparation that we've got during the summer and the sharing of the plans of how we will have uh, tackled all this, if and when it will have uh, happened. So basically people are working more on uh, uh, ordinary approach right now rather than uh, an, uh, like a, a heroism uh, uh, slunge. So I think this can work as long as we are able still to keep uh, organizing and forecasting well uh, the next steps. everyone as they did in March, because the, the, it does not that morale anymore. So the burden of the organization uh, on the management is higher now, and we have the responsibility to really coordinate well these people, to not ask anything extra than their like ordinary work, which is uh, already extraordinary. Yeah. Niam, when you think of Mount Sinai at this point, uh, and again, we're not necessarily talking just about right now with the pandemic, we're trying to think prospectively about the hospital five, 10, 15 years from now. So it's not just the pandemic response and stress that we're talking about, but sort of as a, as a hospital administrator, how should the hospital of the future be dealing with the mental stresses of, of various things that in ways differently, perhaps that they uh, have deal with now of, of the staff and the doctors and the nurses and the orderlies who work in that situation? Yeah, you know, I, I think there's uh, two, two kind of thoughts I have here. One, that um, you know, we should be more proactive on, on you know, kind of the, the, the mental health and, and, uh, uh, and, you know, kind of emotional uh, health of our, of our frontline caregivers. And, you know, we, we, do, we do a fair amount of this. I think, you, uh, you know, as, as, you meant, as, as Shakuma mentioned, you know, we tend to be reactive or responsive. Um, you know, we, we have a Center for Wellbeing, Stress, and Resiliency that we launched on the heels of COVID. Right, and now its its mission is much broader than COVID, um, but it was uh, it was an instigating event for us to say, and you know we've done done a fair amount for for stress and resiliency for our staff over you know the past decades, but it, it was it was um, it made it clear to us that we need to do more, and so I think that's good, you know, continuing to invest in that, recognizing, uh, you know, or really never losing track of the fact that for our frontline caregivers. Uh, it is a more emotionally challenging job than most others. Um, and it, that is, you know, it's just part of the nature of the job to, you know, and when you have a situation like this where, you know, a nurse is maybe used to, used to seeing one patient pass every two weeks in their unit and they have, you know, three, four, five pass in the same shift. I mean, that, that is challenging. Uh, when we screened our, our caregivers for, uh, PTSD, 25% of them screen positive in the initial screen. Um, and that's, you know, we, we need to, again, recognize and, and invest actively. The other thing that I would say that's, you know, more broadly across the, the entire hospital industry, uh, one of the things we learned as we went through this challenge uh, in COVID, and this is, you know, I can speak just for the United States, uh, I'd, I'd be interested with the you know, Alexander and Giacomo field is similar in their uh, in their countries, but you know, in, in the United States, healthcare industry, especially healthcare delivery, the hospital industry, tends to be very insular. Uh, there's 
there are fewer people who come in from out of industry, less cross-functional training. It's fairly hierarchical. You know, the you get the next job when your boss leaves and you're promoted linearly up. And, you know, uh, the, the head of nursing used to be the head of a unit nursing and you used to be a floor nurse and the head of finance used to be the, you know, vice finance head. And, you know, it's, it's, it's a very uh, hierarchical and rigid industry. It's an old school industry in that way compared to many others. And um, what we learned as we went through all this is that actually the people who fared the best were those who could think cross-functionally, those who could think nimbly, those who could pick up a second job you know, fighting whatever fire was going on, you know, while handling their other thing. And, um, and that sort of training, again, it's more common in some other industries where there's more diagonal advancement, where there's more, you know, shuffling of leadership to, to build different cross-functional skills, more bringing in of people from out of industry uh, and, and, you know, cross-industry, cross-pollination. And so I think we're realizing that to have a more nimble and durable workforce uh, some of that will be important, and that, that changes the talent and learning development agenda, that changes the leadership development agenda, it changes how we think about bringing in new talent. Um, mm-hmm. And I think we, we learned that uh, some of, you know, every organization's greatest strength is its greatest weakness. Um, and so by no means am I saying these are bad things about the industry. I think, you know, there's tremendous depth of expertise in the hospital industry. Uh, you have a lot of 30-year veterans who are running certain things, um, but that comes with the cost of you're a 30 year veteran in a specific area running the thing and you may not have thought you know in six different ways about the problem and so um you know to be to be responsive to big shocks to the system like what we just went through uh more nimble and cross-functional training i think injecting some of that into the culture will be will be helpful you know here listening to you and that response uh, and i'm going to ask another question only because i don't see again feel free if you're a participant and you want to ask a question to raise your hand uh, Oh, and I see Axel has one. So I'm going to come to you in one minute, Axel, and you get to ask the first question. Um, but you mentioned other industries. And one of the things that we're seeing in some industries right now is they're saying, you know, uh, we're a big law firm or we're a big tech firm. And we realize that half of our workforce can work remotely. Uh, and we don't really need, you know, to pay these high rents, you know, for the big law office down on, in Midtown Manhattan. We're going to have a, a smaller group of folks because we need some people in person, but we have a lot of people working remotely. Throwing up into the three of you, do you think healthcare is going to move in that direction? I mean, do you see a larger percentage of your healthcare workforce with the rise of telemedicine, with virtual care, with all the things we can do now on Zoom and, and, and electronically, et cetera? Do you see the workforce of the hospital changing? Obviously, there'll be you need physicians and nurses to, you know, to provide certain care personally, but is the workforce of the hospital going to change and, and sort of follow some of the trends we might see in, in other industries? Uh, Alexandra, let me, let me ask you that one, and then we're going to go to Axel for a question. Just, just uh, before answering your question, let me just say that uh, we are quite lucky to be managers in the healthcare industry. And the ethical drive from healthcare professionals help us to deal with this crisis. And in that sense, we are quite lucky uh, what probably we need to learn is that pro- we need better managers and we need better competencies on healthcare managers, and, but not on the healthcare professionals. That, that's at least in my sense. Following what Niam was saying in Giacomo, that I believe that for this second wave, uh, we have a big problem in our hands uh, to mobilize our healthcare force, um, mostly because they are tired, um, they face this first wall, and they are seeing this again, and it's not going to be easy to mobilize uh, and to incentivize all the healthcare professionals to, 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 to cope with this uh, uh, repeated situation, probably worst scenarios. Um, yeah, just going back w- uh, with your question, I believe that before the COVID crisis, we were seeing some trend on changing the, uh, our uh, conventional, traditional healthcare professionals. We have seen that we really needed to have new skills, as Neil was saying, uh, there was a lack uh, or a gap of skills, even on the healthcare professionals. Uh, we don't have uh, uh, even data analysts, geneticists, uh, even uh, uh, training on disease management or disease managers. So there was lots of uh, uh, even specific functions that we didn't have the skills. Uh, even in, uh, I don't know if that's the case in, in New York, but even we continue to have uh, and fruitful discussions about what is the role of the doctor or the role of the nurse. Uh, will this skill mix 
combinations. And we continue to see all this shock between uh, healthcare professionals where we would should be seeing mostly is a patient-centered approach where everyone should be focused on delivering the best care. But we continue to be this to see this clash between different healthcare professionals. I even see clashes between lab workers and nurses or even physicians and uh, 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 physiatrists. So you see this clashes uh, continuously and the, in that sense uh, I believe that uh, uh, at least we need to push for it. Uh, I, I am a little bit repeating myself, but our hopes are not probably what we are going to see. But I really hope that uh, uh, we are going to see a more patient-centered uh, human resources planning approach. Well, I think well, one way to get some additional training, I'll put a little plug in here right now, uh, is I think a lot of healthcare workers would benefit from taking a hospital simulation which actually, uh, you know, Bacconi and the Association uh, and Columbia will be hosting uh, in early December. And I say that not simply to plug for that particular program, although I'm happy to plug for that particular program, but those kinds of programs, you know, really sort of training, you know, using simulation techniques. We talk about other industries. Other industries use simulation all the time. Physicians use simulation in medical school, you know, to simulate surgeries and procedures. Managers, I think, have not used sort of simulations clearly as much as they could and should, and it becomes a very effective tool. Axel, let me turn to you. You have a question. Yeah, thanks very much, uh, Michael. It, it's fascinating, and I just want to make a brief observation, actually, about the capacity, and that is in the UK, um, we scaled up, uh, just like Niam said, actually, we uh, scaled up capacity, ICU capacity, very, very quickly in the so-called uh, Nightingale, Hos Nightingale hospitals. And I'm sure you're aware of that. And, and something similar, of course, in New York happened with their sort of like ship in the harbor and whatever uh, happened there. But one of the problems is we had thousands of places just here in the northwest of England, and we only used 54. We only had 54 patients in 1,000 beds. And why is that? The reason was very simple. It's not that we didn't need the ICU capacity, the additional we built there. We didn't have the staff to staff, staff the, the, the ICU capacity. We didn't actually have enough trained doctors or nurses to actually do this. So this is the, this is the problem. It's a long-term strategy really that's needed. And the other thing I just wanted to manage, uh, 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 mention here is uh, something that was raised also in the chat on the side and quite a few people raised actually, where are the patients in this picture? Where are actually patients? We talk about patients all the time, but in fact, our hospitals, many of our hospitals here in the UK in such a crisis mode um, are actually fairly poorly connected to the patient populations themselves that they actually serve. There's a lot of local intelligence who is vulnerable. Uh, social care know the vulnerable people in their communities already, you know, but the, the fragmentation of the health system is so bad that they don't actually, get, they cannot use that intelligence. And the patient involvement is also relatively poor, you know, very, very, very low. Um, and, and that means also it has a knock-on effect on compliance. Because whenever patients come in, they're being served and then they're being transferred back into community, we're not using them, as it were, and their experiences as, as it were, testimonials of why it's important to comply in a, in a pandemic like this. Uh, and we, we're just using those patients and then we are glad they've kind of, kind of left our hospitals again. So the interconnectedness of these issues is actually very, very poor, at least here in the UK. Uh, of course, I just want to raise that because that's, of course, something that also was raised in the chat. No, oh, I think that's a great point. Let me throw that open to the, to the panelists. Uh, where's the patients? And you're thinking about maybe the change the role of the patient having gone through a COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Who wants to take that one on? I mean, I can you... take that, uh, that one off. Uh, oh. I think uh, at least from uh, the experience I've seen in, uh, in Piedmont uh, last spring and we're like facing it again right now, uh, for the patient ha has been uh, even tougher than has been for the staff because if, and also for uh, the families of the patient. If we think about how we needed to isolate the hospital, not allowing anyone in or out, not allowing any a relationship among the, the patient and their family. I've seen many patients unfortunately dying without having the chance to see again their family, their sons or their wives. 
So I think this is definitely something we should keep in mind again in this uh, new wave uh, in trying to uh, activate uh, some channels as we did in uh, spring and try to potentiate that. We, we did uh, provide uh, uh, some tablets in every single unit, allowing patient to contact their, uh, their family and allowing uh, uh, to get them some support. And this was just like a very tiny, small uh, way of uh, supporting the patient. But uh, right now, the, 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 the crisis as it was in, uh, in spring is so tough that we tend to oversee the need of uh, the patient as humans. And this is really uh, horrible, I think, from uh, uh, like uh, an ethic perspective, because we are just facing and trying to save and cure and treat people, but we are not thinking about them as people because we don't have time to really focus on uh, all the need that they have. And I think this is a part of the tragedy that we're facing right now as this pandemic is hitting us again. Right. Yeah, uh, let me just uh, go, go uh, continue this discussion. I really believe that we, even in the beginning, or at least during the first wave, uh, the issue about immunization of uh, care wasn't the, pro the priority at all. Uh, uh, even not only for patients, but also for families. Uh, I must say that uh, even all well, the patients were completely isolated without the possibility to contact uh, their loved ones. Uh, even uh, uh, when we had the death, um, our instructions and our first approach was to, to close the, uh, uh, the casket and to bury the person without the family to see it or the possibility to see it. What in the meanwhile, what we tried to do and to try to increase capacity was using new technologies to allow uh, to use tablets or, uh, or, or smartphones to contact the patients. Then we started this uh, uh, new ways of uh, allowing family members to visit uh, uh, their loved ones in the hospital. Um, even even uh, uh, um, we have issues, for example, in palliative care services without COVID. As you know, we isolated most of our vulnerable population and we tried to develop these kind of services. I must say even the, our Portuguese association, we delivered uh, uh, um, in, 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 with other partners awards to, uh, um, to, to innovative ideas that allow this increase of humanization of services uh, to allow this kind of uh, uh, services to deliver close to the patients, uh, close to the families, even, for example, in the support as, uh, in long-term care facilities, I don't know if uh, in your countries uh, it happened like this, we, but we closed down most of our long-term uh, long facilities to visits. So the, all people were quite isolated uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, that were institutionalized. So we really need to think in the point of view of those persons. Uh, and I totally agree that there is, there is a lot to do in increasing uh, uh, the role and to hear the patient view, but not only the patient, also the families uh, in the way that we provide care. Right. So we are almost out of time. Uh, and while there's not a lot of hands up on the participant list, while you were talking, I actually just sort of scanned through. I hadn't had a chance to, to really follow the chat, but I saw there were lots of folks that asked lots of interesting questions on the chat. Um, so I think people really were engaged in what the three of you were saying. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think my sort of closing thought is, you know, healthcare is historically or has historically been such a siloed industry. You know, you've had the hospital and you've had the nursing home, you've had the public health prevention people, and you've had, you know, this group and that group. Over the last years, and I suppose, Liam, these are some of the kind of things that you're working on right now and others. Over the last number of years, there's been this major move to sort of think about sort of integrating, you know, and consolidating and sort of organizing and coordinating the different elements of, of, of a health system to include both the hospital, but obviously much more to include all of the kinds of things and the social determinants and the services that people receive and need outside of the hospital. And I think, you know, seminars like this in which we talk about, you know, sort of the future of the hospital but recognize and acknowledge that the hospital is not an isolated box anymore that exists separate from the community in which it, in, in which it operates, uh, that exists separate from the public health of the community in which it operates, uh, I think are, are really important events. Um, so I wanna thank Liam and Giacomo and, and Alexandra. Uh, I wanna thank Alex for coordinating and hosting uh, this event. And I wanna thank Viviana, although actually I'm gonna turn it back over. We have one minute left, Viviana. I'm not sure if you want to make any final or closing comments, but really, yeah. all of you, uh, it's really yeah. been a 
thank you thank you michael thank you everybody i mean just in closing this webinar i would like to say that's been fascinating discussion i think uh, the question the overarching question uh, of this webinar uh, has been packed into, I don't know, many streams, Michael. So we really need to probably think about uh, uh, the way to follow up and to develop some of the elements that we impact through this discussion. And it's been really fascinating. Thanks a lot for uh, your uh, uh, commitment in the discussion. And I think also your uh, uh, critical thinking and frank and open, uh, um, you know, contribution that sometime, uh, you know, was was really needed, uh, and uh, and and be critical. So, thanks a lot. Thank you for your uh, extraordinary facilitation, Michael, and thanks to uh, Axel for uh, and the Hema Network for hosting us. Uh, and as you all said, uh, all of this has been recorded, so you can listen and you can contact us, and uh, we we will be able probably to follow up on some of the discussion further in the future. Thanks a lot. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye for now.